So welcome to the HKS Energy Policy Seminar. I'm Joe Aldi. I'll serve as the host today. As a reminder, we are both in this very full room in the Rubenstein Building, as well as on Zoom in our hybrid format. So pleased to have friends well, uh, joining us here, both in the room and online. We're thrilled to have with us today, Jason Grumet for his talk titled, and I will note, he wins the award for the best title of any talk this semester. This talk's entitled, The Future is Very Bright and Every Day is a Freaking Crisis, an up-close look at the clean energy transition. Jason is the Chief Executive Officer of the American Clean Power Association. The American Clean Power Association represents nearly 800 these and is the leading trade association representing the clean energy industry. Before taking the reins at American Clean Power, Jason found founded the Bipartisan Policy Center, which he ran as president for 15 years. Prior to founding BPC, Jason led the Bipartisan National Commission on Energy Policy, and he's a graduate of Harvard Law School. So even though we're just a little bit down the hill, it's great to have Jason back on campus here at Harvard. Jason is going to make some opening remarks, and then we'll go to Q&A. Jason, welcome to the Energy Policy Seminar. Thank you, Joe. All right. For low expectations, then you can clap at the end. All right, delighted to be here. Um, as Joe said, I want to try to give you the sense of the promise and peril of the clean energy transition. Um, the emotional arc is going to be kind of positive and then kind of scary, and then end on a little positive. Um, start off talking a little bit about the politics of the clean energy transition, then focus a bunch on the deployment issues and challenges we're facing. So um, here's the good news. The Inflation Reduction Act actually provides the first kind of coherent, bipartisan, broad-based intellectual embrace for the nation's clean energy transition, right? It's about innovation and investment, which has always you know, created a lot of enthusiasm in you know, most of the political circles we drive in. Um, it's not the last 20 years where we fought about taxation regulation. Um, and so, you know, that creates, I think, um, a different kind of opportunity to build the broad-based coalition that's going to be necessary for durable progress. I will note, um, in particular deference to uh, our host, Joe Aldi, that we have finally moved away from the greatest political malpractice in the energy climate debate, which was deferring to economists to lead our politics. <laughs> The phrase, don't pick technologies, which was seen almost as a moral commitment to a you know, carbon pricing regime, was just terrible. All that members of Congress want to do is pick technologies. Technologies are fun. Technologies are jobs. Technologies are people. Taxes are taxes. I will share with you um, a conversation I had some years ago um, with Senator Manchin when I was for like the 13th time flailing to convince him to express some enthusiasm for a carbon price. And um, he basically like with kind of a poking um, kind of emotion said, listen, I've heard all this so many damn times. You show me a kid graduating from West Virginia University who can make $85,000 a year in the clean energy industry, then let's have a conversation. Then carbon pricing is about, you know, making it West Virginia part of the new economy, not just punishing West Virginia for building the old economy. And so the good news is that's what the IRA is doing, right? It's taking a little longer than we'd like, but we are basically at a massive scale building clean energy facilities with tremendous economic vitality and employment and manufacturing across the country. And so my shred of um, carbon pricing optimism, which I feel obligated to share with you, is we just got the sequence wrong, right? We were trying to say to people, hey, we're gonna put a tax in place, trust us, trust the government and the banks that this magical thing is going to happen. We can't describe it to you, but like trust us, good stuff's coming. Not gonna make the sale for anybody who actually needs to get elected, which we found painfully over about 15 years. Flip the momentum, make this about building and scaling these incredibly fun, exciting technologies that every member of Congress and the Senate and governors are going to cut ribbons at then we're having a different kind of conversation. So six or seven years from now, I would love to come back and have a conversation about optimism, about carbon pricing. Um, here's the rest of the good news. The actual deployment 
of the IRA is going to anchor a tremendous amount of political support in conservative parts of the country. Our estimate is that 80% of the announced investment since the IRA was passed is going into districts currently run by congressional Republicans. 80%, right? So the kind of fundamental intellectual anchor of the legislation has always appealed to a more conservative kind of imagination of solution ideology. The execution of the program is going to fundamentally be kind of buoyant for many largely rural conservative communities. But the process of passing it was so toxic, right? The reconciliation process, which is basically, this was Biden's, we won, you lost the victory lap, $10 trillion, build back better. We're gonna do it just with Democrats, you know, Republicans need not apply. That left a pretty strong fury in the Republican party about this piece of legislation. I will tell you that that is metabolizing some, as we saw happen with the Affordable Care Act. Um, you may have been following the debt ceiling debate two months ago, where at the very last minute, the kind of IRA tax credits were tossed on the heap of things that should be cut. So we were working with a whole bunch of Republicans who didn't want that to happen. It became a us versus them. We got to get, you know, Kevin onto the field. There was a vote that had unanimous Republican support for repealing big parts of the IRA. The difference is several members of Congress called to apologize, which would not have happened a year ago, right? Basically saying, we had to do this. This is not rinse and repeat. You can count on us. We're gonna be there for kind of the sustained success of the IRA. I'll also note that um, about two months ago was the anniversary of the Inflation Reduction Act. Our initial instinct was just to kind of not jump on it, right? We're working very hard, and I'll say a little more about kind of the ACP's political efforts, but we're working very hard to kind of center this debate and take the partisan kind of you know, harshness out of it. And so doing a big victory lap around the IRA was just not really strategic. At the same time, it seemed kind of weird just to look the other way, right? I mean, this was by far the most you know, compelling fundamental accelerant of the energy transition we've ever had. So what we decided to do was an experiment. We described what we were doing as a year of historic investment, in, you know, celebrating a year of historic investment in clean energy. And we asked a bunch of our buddies if they would co-host this with us. And the US Chamber, the National Association of Manufacturers, the Interstate Natural Gas Association or the pipeline folks, American Chemistry Council, and several others, EEI, Edison Electric Institute, the Nuclear Energy Institute, all co-hosted our party. So that's a signal, right? There, there is a growing acceptance of the success and the desire to kind of persevere in this transition. Um, but just last week, um, the uh, Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee and the uh, House Energy and Commerce Committee put out a study, IRA, irresponsible, reckless, alarming. The entry quote was, the IRA is one of the most economically disastrous pieces of legislation ever enacted. Now, this was Senator Barrasso, who um, you know, is the chair of the Senate Energy Committee. Um, we've been working really closely with the staff on permitting reform, like really working to build some significant opportunities to scale and accelerate clean energy, um, but not, you know, part of the kind of larger political drama, right? So we're still in that, I think, pretty significantly vulnerable space. Turning on to um, climate advocacy and progressive politics. Uh, unfortunately, progressive politics is creating almost as much of a challenge for implementing the IRA as conservative politics. So first of all, you may remember back in the Build Back Better days, it was initially a $10 trillion program of kind of energy infrastructure and then social infrastructure. And the social fell off, right? You just was not support for moving those kinds of massive investments in childcare and early child education and other things that are, I think, very important, but we're not gonna achieve the support that uh, was being proposed. And the administration said, well, we'll get that, we'll catch up on that stuff, right? We'll try to do that through executive action. One of the implications of that is that we are freighting the already almost impossible goal 
of achieving a net zero economy by mid-century with a whole bunch of other social ambitions to increase local involvement in permitting and siting, to make sure that we are increasing at you know, rapid pace the domestic content away from foreign supply chains, to make sure that you know, as the investments move forwards, we are not tolerating existing kind of fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, so all of that is making things harder. It is also, I think, worth um, acknowledging that there is kind of a fundamental ideological shift going on. So the Inflation Reduction Act gives big tax credits to big rapacious companies to lead the clean energy transition. This is great news because we have to do clean energy transition at a speed unlike anything we've tried in the country before. If I were guessing you know, where we are right now, I think we'd get there by around 2187, 2087, sorry, and, and another century. Um, well, Freudian slip. <laughs> um, but giving big tax credits to big companies, most of whom also have fossil fuel assets, is not kind of the vibe of a lot of the historic environmental advocacy, right? There's been kind of since E.F. Schumacher, kind of a small is beautiful, let's do local solar panels in Vermont. Um, and there's been some, and this is not trying to say this is across the entire you know, movement, but some oppositional status to corporate America. And so this idea of like getting behind big companies to solve the climate challenge is just not resonating in the same way that um, talking about the problem was, right? We're not seeing the same kind of crisis mentality in solving the problem as we were seeing in announcing the problem. Last thing I will mention, um, there's no measurement or feedback loop. We're all talking about how much money is being spent. We're all talking about inputs. There's almost no active effort other than the one that Professor Aldi is trying to get started to actually see how we're doing, which also makes it very difficult when we're trying to convince people who care about climate change that we need to go faster. And so we're working on that. So where we are right now is we have a law which is kind of you know intellectually, ideologically, broadly embraced, where it's being implemented um, in you know rural conservative parts of the country with this anchor of political distress. And basically we have this value of risk. Once we get the projects in the ground, once we have hundreds of thousands of people employed in this industry, we're good. But until that happens for the next couple of three years, the politics create a continued vulnerability. So that's the promise and peril on the political side. Moving to deployment, which is the, the hard part, um, just a level set, right? We have roughly 22% of the um, electric power in the country produced through renewable energy. It's about 10% wind, 8.5% hydro, 3.5% solar. That compares to about 30% in the EU. Also want to note our non-carbon buddies in the nuclear industry produce about 20%. So right now we're about 20% you know, renewable, 20% nuclear, 60% fossil. Here's the great news. Since the IRA was passed about 14 months ago, $340 billion has been announced as new investment in clean technology deployment and manufacturing, which is basically more than you know, eight times the amount that um, was happening in an average year. Um, the manufacturing facilities are super important, right? 90 significant manufacturing facilities that are really bringing together the union and kind of you know, middle-class ambition with this industry in ways that are incredibly important. In some cases, people think it's working too well, right? One of the criticisms of the law was it was scored by the CBO at $390 billion, but there were no caps on a lot of these credits. So some people were suggesting like, it might be a trillion dollars. Like, is that good news or bad news? It kind of depends on your point of view about the necessity of the clean energy transition. But so there's this, incredible mojo, lots of money being invested, significant upside, um, that's good news. The bad news is that a combination of um, government decisions and indecision and some pretty significant macroeconomic challenges are causing us a real challenge right now. And I'm gonna kind of run through uh, a few of those and then we can get to questions. So the key issues are, permitting and transmission, 
the supply chain and workforce. I'm gonna focus mostly on permitting and transition. So the IRA provided big subsidies to produce clean energy. There was a big debate about whether there should be incentives to transmit it, those didn't happen. So having clean power is really cool, especially if you can move it to where people live. And right now we have tremendous constraints in our capacity to move clean power around the country. Um, you need to think mostly about the kind of interregional transmission, right? So the nation has kind of built these balkanized 10 different power regions. They operate reasonably well internally. There's almost no connectivity to one another. So the US uh, has built about three gigawatts of interregional transmission in the last 10 or 15 years. South America has built 22 gigawatts, Europe 44, and guess what? China has built 260 gigawatts of this kind of interregional transmission. Another just, you know, slightly terrifying fact. So we think we need about 200,000 miles of high voltage transmission by the, you know, mid 2030s to stay on track with the clean energy transition, 200,000. The last decade, we built 1,800 miles. Right, so this, is, this isn't a fiddling problem, right? This is a mental reimagination of how we build the future problem. A lot of it comes back to federalism. There used to be this idea called the local power company. You'd have a city, you'd have a utility, they'd draw kind of a ring around the city, and that would be the you know, basic you know, source of your home domestic manufacturing electricity. That's not the way it works anymore. But the architecture of our regulatory system is still vested in this sense of local control, state control, regional control. The mechanisms to do long-term planning don't actually speak the same language. So that's a big challenge. I can talk a little bit about some progress that's being made there. Permitting. I won't dwell on this too much. It's been very much in the news. Um, the fact that the clean power industry is now a big rapacious industry means we are bumping into the same problems that the energy industry bumps into. And so I think a lot of the, you know, kind of premise of the American Clean Power Association is we're part of the energy industry. We're part of the energy industry that's moving to a net zero emissions profile, but we are doing that in transition. A lot of people like to talk about where you're going in transition. Not a lot of people like to talk about where you are. Where we are is 20% of the national energy mix. And if we are not strategically thoughtful about working with the existing embedded infrastructure, we're not gonna get there. And so there's a lot of collaboration between my organization and API and NEI and others on permanent reform. We care about it because we think we're moving at about 20% you know, as fast right now as we need to, to achieve a kind of ambitious 80% reduction by the 2030s. Just a you know, high profile achievement, the Sunzia power line was just finally permitted. It's a big power line. It's gonna move clean power from Arizona and Nevada into California, it took 17 years. The people building this are my members. They have been building it literally for 17 years. You know, that's just not gonna get the job done. The other way to think about it is um, we, need to, we need a lot of land, which I was just talking about. There's a lot of federal land. There are almost, there's almost no renewable power on federal land, right? We have 120 gigawatts of deployed renewables, three gigawatts on Bureau of Land Management land. Well, it just shows you how hard it is to get the federal government to work to actually advance clean power deployment. All right, next two problems, supply chain. This is a problem affecting the entire world. We're just trying to do something really big and really fast. So we're struggling with it. The demand for wind power, solar, particularly post Putin attack on Ukraine has shot up. And so there's a very significant upward price pressure right now on just the stuff we want to build. The other probably bigger problem is that core aspects, particularly the solar supply chain and the battery supply chain, are anchored in China. And not like 30% anchored, like 95% anchored, right? It takes four or five different steps to make a solar panel. There are a couple of the steps in the middle that are only being done in China or being done by Chinese companies that are moving to Asia. There's you know, optimism for manufacturing in India. You know, about 50 of the 90 facilities that we have announced are solar, but they're not the mining and processing. They're the solar panel manufacturing side of things. 
this isn't good, right? I think one of the massive benefits of the clean energy transition is it is US-based domestic power, not vulnerable to weaponization of fossil fuel inputs. But if the ability to actually anchor our economy in a technology depends upon collaboration with what may wind up being an ongoing hostile relationship, that's a big problem. So there's a lot of effort to figure out how do we actually reshore, onshore the supply chain. Um, it's being done with um, not quite the sophistication and nuance that's necessary. It took 20 years to move the supply chain to China. We're not gonna get it back in 15 months. They also have the intellectual property. So it's not just a, do we wanna build it? Will we pay the wages? We don't know how to build the highest technology, clean energy technologies right now. That will change, but it is currently a problem. All right, best problem. We need to hire 500,000 workers in about 10 years. Like, woohoo, we brag about that a bunch. We need to hire 500,000 clean energy workers in the next 10 years. There is not a pipeline. We are already finding that in particularly the wind industry, they can't find people who are wind technicians. So we are spending a lot of time working with labor. Labor dynamics in this country, as you know, are complicated, but there needs to be a fundamental different imagination about how you get talent from all communities, how you train people, how you certify people against safety standards, something that my organization is trying to work on. All right, five or six more minutes. So what are we doing about this as a government? The president announced boldly that we were taking a whole of government approach to climate change. Um, and you know, that was a sense of like, hooray, we have finally achieved that. Two problems. One is getting everybody in government to talk to each other is not the most efficient process. The second problem is where it's not really true everywhere, right? So there are places where this kind of you know, assertion of this is a top priority is just not being met by the facts on the ground. One of the problems is they just haven't hired enough people to do the work, right? The guidance, the translating the legislation into guidance is just going too slow. So people are just waiting. Companies don't know whether they're gonna get the credits, whether they're not gonna get the credits. And so that has been, um, you know, we've probably lost about six months of what was plausible had things worked as quickly as we had hoped. And then again, it's this idea of trying to accomplish a whole bunch of things at once, right? So there are credits in the IRA for companies who use domestic content. It's a great idea. But the rigidity of implementation isn't working, right? So just one specific example, to achieve the domestic content credit, you have to use 20% of domestic content in your big you know, offshore wind facilities, which is hard, but that's doable if you really stretch for it. But before you can actually reach that goal, you have to build the giant pole, which uses 20,000 tons of steel in the US. Guess how many factories exist in the United States of America who can build those? None. Now we want factories. The companies are investing hundreds of millions of dollars trying to create factories. There was one that was moving forward in Albany, but now it has been slowed down. So, you know, we're talking about how do you create some on-ramp of flexibility? Because if we don't get the opportunity to figure out how to deal with the poles, then we're not gonna have any incentive to do the rest of the domestic content. Just one example. Another example, there are credits for um, energy communities, right? The communities that have been part of the core fossil fuel anchor and history of this country that are now transitioning, like clean energy transition for all, great big idea. So offshore wind, not a lot of communities, 15 miles off the coast. And so, huh, we're trying to argue that ports where you have all the labor and you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment should be considered in that kind of community. Treasury's not sure, doesn't look great. So um, those are some issues. I will not dwell as long as I could on everyone's favorite molecule, hydrogen. Happy to talk about it at length in questions. Just know that the um, risk of a regulatory regime that enables little to no commercial production <coughs> is much greater right now than the risk of a regime, which would be too lax, enabling more pollution than people would like. We are on the verge of not having a domestic hydrogen industry. And this goes back again, just to the overconfidence that people had that the IRA was so bountiful, everything was gonna work out, we could just freight it up with whatever we wanted. Um, 
really scary, right? Because the only way we think to decarbonize 30% of the economy, which is the heavy manufacturing and the transportation, is with green hydrogen. And um, you know, with electric cars, we realized we wanted to do this simultaneously. We were going to switch to electric vehicles, and we were going to decarbonize the grid. With hydrogen, we're kind of flipping that potentially, and you have to decarbonize the grid before you can build the hydrogen. Um, so that's a real risk with significant consequences. Um, last, I'll just touch on interest rates. So we are trying to build giant things fast. Renewable power has very high capital upfront costs and then almost no operating costs, right? You gotta spend $10 billion building an offshore wind farm facility, then the fuel is free, doesn't require nearly the amount of on-site labor as a nuclear facility or a old fossil facility, but the upfront costs are big. And right now, the combination of supply chain has doubled the price of steel and interest rates have basically doubled. So the economics of this industry now are just in a very different place than they were five years ago. Things are gonna go forwards. This is not a yes, no question, but the question is the speed in which we can make this transition. So just to end on the positive note, some may remember uh, when Senator uh, Obama and McCain were running for presidency in 2008 in the middle of the financial crisis, John McCain said, the fundamentals are sound did not land great with the electorate, but I will tell you that the fundamentals of the clean energy transition are sound. Demand growth is unlike anything anyone imagined, something that I'm sure Bill Hogan has thought about. We thought we were kind of flatlined on electricity demand. It's going nuts. And part of it is AI, right? There's a sense that we could actually see something like a double demand for electric power between AI and the electrification of transportation. So. Game on, right? There is no lack of uh, need for new power. And if you look at the long-term cost of clean energy, the uh, basic competitive, you know, low cost, I'm sorry, um, the LCOE, uh, levelized cost of energy, which is kind of like you take the capital costs and the operating costs, we're still looking good, right? So when you look at what like Wall Street cares about, we're pretty good. Real challenge is that the innovation in decision-making is not matching the innovation in technology. What better place than the Kennedy School of Government to suggest that some smart people figure that out and don't fiddle around the edges. We need a fundamentally different imagination of how we build things in this country or we will not get to a mid-century net zero economy. And with that, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you, Jason. So I'd like to open with the first question and get to this challenge that you identified that we've got this 21st century problem of climate change, of decarbonizing our economy. And while we had an IRA of 2022, for the most part, we're using 20th century policy tools to think about how we build out the energy infrastructure. Uh, so my guess is you're here to say, hey, do you have ideas for us? But we'd like to get a sense from you when you sort of think through what, where are there the opportunities mm -hmm. where some new ideas without new laws, mm -hmm. and then I, part two will be what might be the new laws, right? So, so as, as an economist who occasionally has advocated for things that may not be politically viable, I'd like to get your sense of like, where do we think there could be some thoughtful reforms and how we implement law mm -hmm. that could actually make a difference in accelerating the decarbonization investment we need um, and if you're like, hey, the thing is, this is a really tough nut to crack with current laws. Here are the tweaks we could see in new legislation. What might be, you think, politically viable, if not in this Congress, because we can't even get a speaker right now, but maybe in the next Congress, if there is appetite for this, what might be some of the policy tweaks you would see in new legislation that could help enable an accelerated investment in clean energy technologies? So let me start the executive branch and then talk legislation. Um, yeah. Credit to the Biden administration. They did make some significant tweaks to the kind of NEPA permitting process, the federal permitting laws to try to you know, have kind of a time, shot clock time limits and page limits and some efforts to kind of um, modulate some of the you know, cacophony of chaos. Um, pretty baseline stuff, but helpful. Um, they doubled back on that a little bit, which has made a bunch of folks in Congress 
angry when they came out with another recent kind of revision of NEPA, which seemed like it was going back to uh, you know, focus on slowing things down through perfection. Um, but the real issue is intention. A every president since Nixon has had an executive order on speeding up the permitting process. And something that Joe and I were talking about before, we're not a country that's great on trade-offs. There's a lot of lying to ourselves when it comes to the clean energy transition. And you know, one place, and this is a tough issue, but I'll lay it out, is on how you think about local community involvement in permitting decisions. There is mythology that we can make the process far more engaging and push authority down in ways that are gonna create kind of community empowerment and move things faster at a consistent national and regional level. I've never seen it. It feels oxymoronic to me. Um, but we tell ourselves that story because we don't wanna to have to grapple with a very, very tough issue, which is how do we think about the extent to which some communities have been fundamentally antagonized and disadvantaged, which is absolutely true, and the fact that the world's gonna boil if we don't speed things up. We're not having an honest conversation in this administration about how you actually see trade-offs. There's a lot of discussion where people go like this, um, but we don't see the facts that are gonna line that up. Um, we don't solve our healthcare system through local decision-making. We don't solve national security through local decision-making. We don't make our economic decisions nationally through local decision-making. Why, for some reason, climate is gonna be solved through local decision-making? That's a challenge that um, needs to be dealt with, but that's an intention challenge. Legislatively, um, so here's, here's the deal. Um, and you know, the clean power industry is working with a bunch of other of the energy associations to try to advance this. We think there's four parts. On transmission, something to provide an incentive or a requirement for some interregional transmission. This is not just based on the need to move clean energy hundreds of miles, but like kids literally froze to death in their beds in Texas when the Superstorm Uri hit and you couldn't move power into Texas. It is not a modern idea that this nation is, you know, balkanized so that when these regional storms happen, we have no solution. There is an idea that um, would have a minimum transfer capacity so that every region of the country would have to be able to ship some percentage of their um, renewables or you know, total energy capacity across these seams. Details matter, but that is um, plausible. That's what we need. What the gas pipeline folks need is not to be pushed into a corner by states on new pipeline infrastructure. And the issue there is the Clean Water Act, and there's gonna to need to be some kind of limitation on what states can choose to do or just ignore doing. Um, it's kind of backstop authority idea, which says these are critical national infrastructure and that states should have the first pass at things, but at a certain point, the federal government has to step in. We also need to do that on transmission, right? That the state siting organizations have the first shot. In 2005 Energy Act, there was a provision for critical national energy infrastructure. It was used exactly never. It needs to be refined in ways that are usable. So transmission, Clean Water Act, judicial review. So right now there is actually no statute of limitations on when someone can challenge a siting decision under the basic kind of ALA, there's like a presumed kind of six year limit, but like six years is a long time to be able to go back and question a prior decision. So I think there's a lot of agreement that that time frame needs to be lessened. There is a bigger fight about whether in order to get into the court system, you have to have participated in the regulatory process. But there's interest on all sides to, without undermining the fundamental access to courts, to kind of constrain that in a more predictable way. And finally, fourth, and this is the least um, clear, is um, something on critical minerals. We are hearing a lot from conservatives that um, the, what they see as the hypocrisy in the climate system has to be addressed, that climate advocates want all of these outcomes, but all these outcomes depend upon critical minerals that we're not willing to actually mine or process. Um, they're right. We're not going to do 100% of that in the US. We will continue to probably push a lot of it to uh, other parts of the world with less stringent environmental requirements, but we've got to do more. So those four pieces um, could come together. I will just end with a little geeky insight. The problem is there's no gang. Each one of these ideas lands in a different committee. 
And so nobody has the authority to kind of pull it all together without transgressing upon someone else's committee. And they really don't like to do that to each other. So the only way this moves forward is if in fact there was that creation of a gang that had, you know, someone who actually has McConnell's trust and key people from each of the committees. It was the way we passed the Infrastructure Act. It's the way we passed the CHIPS Act. So we're kind of urging a little uh, gang policy uh, if possible. Great, thanks. Let me open it up for questions from the audience. Bill. Uh, Jason, thanks. This is uh, terrific. Um, uh, the United States is rich and uh, there's no doubt we can do this if we set our minds to it and solve all the problems you're gonna solve. Um, and even if it turned out to be twice as expensive as the carbon tax way of doing it, that would be okay, you know, because then we would uh, solve the problem and we'd only pay twice as much. Uh, but we won't actually solve the problem if we don't lead the rest of the world, and particularly the developing world. And what I'd like to hear is your reflections on the lessons that people in the developing world would draw from our policy and our approach uh, to this problem as to what it means for them. You know, it's a very astute and very difficult question to answer. Um, I have come to think that there are only two ways that you really can bring clean technology to the world. One is if it's better and cheaper, if you're willing to bully people with trade. And so, you know, we've been through so many of these conversations at every single cop. Um, the rich countries are not going to give the poor countries enough money to make up for that fundamental delta. There'll be some funds and there'll be some low level island issue, but like we're not within 1% of what would be required if we actually were trying to fund a global solution with current technologies. So we got to make it cheaper and better. Um, you know, I think the reason that people see electric cars moving forwards, they're better. They're not cheaper yet, but they're better. And it's the first time that we have replaced a polluting technology. Well, it's the first time. It is the first most prominent moment that we have replaced a polluting technology with a you know, non-polluting technology and made people want that non-polluting technology. So I think the, imagine, my imagination, and it's not one that gives me tremendous confidence, is if we spend a trillion dollars on technology acceleration and deployment, we will actually develop answers that are good enough for the rest of the world. Yes, please. Inside job. <laughs> um, on the topic of every day is a freaking crisis. Um, offshore wind, I know there was a crisis a couple of days ago in New York with that veto. And I was wondering if you could talk about um, what kind of crisis response looks like for offshore wind or other technologies for you these days. and on offshore wind of what's the kind of timeline for, okay, we're expecting public acceptance. We're expecting, you know, maybe this will happen and this will work. Like what is the grand timeline for offshore wind companies in the US? So offshore wind is at this inflection point where if we can put a couple of things together that are plausible, we will see the industry move forward with the kind of speed that people had hoped, right? The president wanted 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. So that is not off the table. But if a couple of things don't either break our way or government makes some courageous decisions, we could see a, a gap, right? We could see companies basically decide we're going to take our money someplace else. These are global companies. They are doing wind deployment all over the world. Many of them also have fossil assets, something I alluded to, but I'll just touch on. Of the announced clean power and the stuff built last year, about two thirds is being deployed by companies with fossil assets, right? So the capital can move around. A um, couple things that can help. You know, one is that the administration can actually use all the tools in the Inflation Reduction Act to address some of these cost increases by making it possible for companies to have access to the maximum credits. The states are gonna have to recognize that inflation's bad. And you know things that were promised a few years ago just simply cannot be promised at that same price. So what New York did was they canceled contracts, probably going to kill a couple of facilities, and they're going to rebid the contracts. Well, they're going to come back more expensive than what the companies were asking for in their inflation adjustment, right? So you know it was a decision that was hard to 
understand. Governor Hochul also just vetoed a piece of legislation that would have helped Equinor bring power online. I mean, so there's just some decisions going on that just do not line up with the professed commitment to the clean energy transition. I think the other thing that's happening um, in the Northeast that's helpful is you're seeing the states kind of join together and try to create more regional approaches, both regional markets. Every governor who got behind offshore wind wanted the stuff to be built in his or her state. Understand that, but like that's not the most efficient way to have a separate facility in Connecticut and a separate facility in Massachusetts. So there's some kind of regionalization which should lower cost. Um, and then the last thing I just got to mention is um, I don't know how many of you are following this Wales issue. So there's this um, idea which for you know Tucker Carlson is just delicious, which is that the environmentalists are killing the whales. It's just hilarious, right? They're never gonna let go of that. Um, it's not true, right? The whale deaths are happening when they run into big boats and 2% of the maximum 2% of the actual boating traffic in the region has anything to do with offshore wind and everyone monitors and no one's ever had a whale strike. But, you know, a lot gets around the world before the truth puts its boots on kind of problem and saying, you know, we didn't kill that whale is not actually the greatest um, public relations play. We now have um, the likes of some conservative members of Congress and Snooki, those of you who um, Jersey Shore fans. So you know, you know when Snooki's after you, you know that you've made it to the big time. So there's a hearts and minds play that um, you know, companies are getting better at and you're starting to see people try to push back on this. It actually helped quite a bit when the you know, former President Trump said it was driving the whales batty because everyone's so used to fact checking him that all of a sudden in 30 articles saying, no, this isn't true. So that actually had a nice kind of rebound effect. Um, but the wind industry is struggling and um, they're big, beautiful. I mean, they're just gorgeous, giant things, which last thing I'll say is like, there's just no other way to make the Northeast work, right? New York state will not allow gas to come in from Pennsylvania. They're not particularly enthusiastic about hydro coming down from Quebec. They have made climate commitments that make it almost impossible to you know, cite kind of new fossil. They're gonna have to come back, you know? It's just, so that's why I say like, you know, the fundamentals are strong because there's just no other answer. But the question is, is it an efficient or inefficient process? Um, going back to transmission a little bit, right? Our existing grid was 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 built for kind of the fossil energy that that it um was produced and when you think about where our transmission lines would be based on when where our wind and solar resources are right the map looks really different in our ideal world so kind of aside from the permitting and actually like getting these transmission projects done what extent is the kind of clean energy industry involved in some of these master planning or at least dreaming of, of what this would look like, particularly like this is such an easy way to avoid some of the land use. You know, we can we can use so much less land if we cite these well and avoid a lot of these kind of environmental conflicts if we can get this right, which obviously is a hard thing. So it, it's a huge focus. I think, um, you know, renewable power is not being greeted as saviors in local communities. Um, and the local opposition, which is in part very organic. People just don't like kind of anything being built next to them and somewhat weaponized by folks who are not big fans of renewable power is slowing things down, shutting things down. There's a prevalence of ordinances now that basically make it very difficult to build wind and solar power. Um, what you're alluding to is exactly right, right? Wouldn't it be nice if we had some proactive planning if at a kind of national or at least regional level, we could say, these are the places where the nation needs power lines. And what can we do to make sure that every state along the way has something to benefit, right? Because one of the challenges is the state where the power is being produced and the state where the power is being used both have a lot of incentive. The folks in the middle don't have a ton of incentive, right? So there's a lot of conversation about is there a different kind of economic model that makes sure that those states are also benefiting. Um, you know, there is no, um, you know, when you produce oil offshore, right, there's resources that immediately flow to the states. We don't have any kind of mechanism like that. So I think there's a goal around that. There's goals just among the regions to, again, try to say these are the best pathways. The companies have gotten better out of necessity at working with landowners and rerouting, you know, transmission processes. But 
linear infrastructure, if you need a thousand people to say yes, is a pretty exhausting process if you don't have some kind of end of day preemption, which you have for pipelines, but you don't have for transmission. So I've been waiting the whole time for you to use the P word, uh, not planning preemption, right? Because that obviously is the way to speed things up quickly. We've shown we can do it with a border wall. I think we agree that's not the best way to do it. Um, but uh, I mean, we've looked at this at the law school, there's just no way you're going to get this kind of rapidity without some kind of preemption. But what's the politics? Uh, getting so there? they're not great. Um, you know, given any situation when someone has authority, taking it away, rarely something done with a great deal of enthusiasm. An interesting dynamic, though, is if you look at the states that are trying to really move fast on clean power, New York, Illinois, California, they have recently passed state legislation to preempt their local communities. So there's a little bit of a question of, you know, is the reality of just needing more centralized decision making, you know, so it's flowing up to the go the governors are willing to arrogate authority to themselves. Will they share? Um, conversations are starting at the RGA and the DGA. I think there is a strong kind of pro energy interest. Senator Barrasso did offer to preempt the states outright on siting pipelines. So the 10th Amendment is kind of a matter of um, convenience at times. Um, but yeah, we've got to grapple with that. And a little bit, you know, this again just comes down to national unity, right? If we're trying to build some sense of federal purpose, if the country's this divided, if you don't have a president that can give a sense of like every part of the country is going to be some part of the solution and you're going to see pipeline, like we just don't have that kind of collective action imagination right now. So I think it's going to be small steps. I'd like to ask you about this conflict or tension uh, between the uh, people who want environmental goals, particularly the climate goals, and have been very much out in front on this issue. And then the consumer side, where people are concerned about higher prices, that if you go to this transition, prices will go up. Now, I realize solar and wind, well, solar went down. Mm -hmm. Wind has gotten the supply chain problem that you've mentioned. Uh, and then you've got to build all the transmission, you got to upgrade the distribution systems, so prices are going to go up. And what you're seeing is pushback around the world right now on the question of prices, that if you do the transition and if you do it fast, which we all think, yeah. which a lot of people in this room think we should do it fast, uh, there is, you see the, uh, in UK, there's a pushback, uh, you see a pushback in Germany right now. You see the governor here has written uh, Biden uh, a letter saying, can we have more subsidies for offshore wind because we don't want to jack letter. the price up. You look at all the RTO leaders and say, well, we don't want to do all these changes because we'll get blamed for higher prices. How do you deal with this emerging tension over the cost and the prices that result from this transition and the need to do this transition quickly? So um, you know, the, co the cost issue has always been there. I think that, you know, despite uh, aspiration, new does tend to cost more than old, particularly in a system that does not price the externalities, I will note. Um, and, you know, just to kind of reiterate what you're saying, right, I mean, New York State basically canceled the first wave of offshore wind projects because despite the manufacturing and despite the arguments about long-term savings in the near term, there were going to be big cost increases and the, you know, decision makers were economic regulators that weren't taking those other things into account. Um, and they said, no, um, you know, I think we are still encouraged that the economics of wind and solar are going to be in the, you know, preferable over a decade to what they're replacing. Um, but in the near term, you know, one of the reasons obviously that people got enthusiastic about the IRA is um, people, um, well, our grandkids, are paying for it, but it is basically taking some of those cost increases out of the consumer um, kind of immediacy. Um, you know, I think that um, it, you're seeing costs in some parts of the country. And if you're looking at electricity rates in California and the Northeast, they're starting to show up in ways that, you know, people really see. Power rates in much of the country are still pretty low. And so I think where a lot of the kind of, you know, I mean, offshore wind is a unique situation because it's the most expensive stuff being built in the places with the most expensive rates. Um, we think there's some room in the rest of the country for what the actual cost would be of 
wind and solar deployment with the IRA banner. Thanks for a great presentation. And back to your comments on China and the first question about um, some more international partnerships potentially. Uh, it would seem that there's no solution to this without China um, as the other the major emitter and obviously a major supplier to, to the current technical solutions. Uh, is there any sort of thinking or an imagination out there that there's potential to put a put a bound around that possible relationship or partnership or cooperation with China on this particular issue, even alongside some pretty fierce competition in other areas, because there's almost like a mutually assured destruction yeah. paradigm occurring here? Not this week. <laughs> so, um, and I'm not, I'm going to get the details wrong, but despite all of the tensions between the US and China, we did have a collaboration on basically technology. And, and that, I mean, there, there's, a, there's been a longstanding US-China bilateral that just expired and wasn't actually um, re-upped, right? So at the moment, we're not going in the good direction. Um, you know, again, I, I, trade, right? The, we we got to solve problems through mechanisms that can scale, right? This is why I believe that the Existing energy companies have to be leading parts of the climate solution because they're logistics companies who know how to scale. International relations are basically driven by trade and war. Hoping to take war off the table, we're back to trade. And so there are you know, efforts underway to imagine US-China climate policy being you know, mediated more clearly through trade, some of it potentially punitive, right? There's an idea of a carbon border tax adjustment this is the tax idea that has slipped into the debate um, in which the kind of embedded carbon in a product would be taxed at the border. Um, there's a lot of conservative support for that because the you know, kind of per you know, kind of thousand dollars of production, US carbon is much lower than China's. So we think that would be a tax that benefits our companies. We live in a glass house. And so Europe would be doing the same thing. So you could see a kind of, we could stumble into a bit of a carbon pricing regime um, thoughtlessly if possible. Um, but you know, I think that as you, we're seeing tensions with China increasing, we saw China make an announcement a couple of days ago that they were restricting some of the key kind of critical minerals for batteries based on national security interests. So that's another problem that we are uh, talking about a lot. Hi, thank you so much, Alicia Harley, a very engaging talk. I wanted to go back to your comment on sort of this trade-off between uh, a speedy transition and one that takes into account local participation. Last week, we heard from Anna Cohen, uh, NEPA at the White House, mm -hmm. and it seems like the Biden administration's take at the moment is really that you need to do participation in permitting early and often, and if you don't, you don't get anywhere. And of course, these two things are sort of fundamentally at tension, but I'd be interested in your creative thinking on how do we sort of deal with these equity tensions that are clear, clearly sort of at the heart of our history of industrialization and energy in our country yeah. while also moving fast. Yeah, um, so a couple of things. Um, one is that, you know, before the IRA, about 80% of the new energy in the country was coming from clean resources. With the IRA, with all of the enthusiasm around it, one should think with some confidence that doing things faster is going to be good. Not entirely good every place, right? But the current permitting system was designed basically to slow down bad things. And there's now a mind shift to speeding up good things in which there would be actual, you know, public health benefits. You know, I mean, offshore wind is gonna be displacing, you know, oil-based, you know, energy in Connecticut, which is a huge EJ. So, I mean, you know, again, hard for everybody, and this is not like, you know, disdain for local people who care a lot about their communities, but hard for local people to appreciate all of the different benefits of this move towards clean energy. It is clearly directionally correct. The other issue is that um, it's being pretty much built in mostly rural America. Not a lot of, you, know, you check out the real estate prices in Cambridge, not a lot of wind farms coming your way anytime soon, right? So I think the sense of the kind of presumption that there's a huge EJ conflict is not where we actually see the issue. Where we're finding issues is local community siting boards where one county commissioner, after three years of everyone working on local process says no, and you're done. So 
I mean, the co everyone can be better at this. Um, the companies are trying hard, spending a lot of resources, deploy. I mean, they're doing any obvious thing you could think of, like people are trying to do, because having these facilities embraced is incredibly valuable compared to having to, you know, battle for them. Um, but it comes a little bit back to this kind of federalism question. I mean, do we want local county commissioners having kind of unilateral decision making over the energy transition? You don't want them to have no role, but right now, you know, they pretty much can, in most places, just say yes or no. Um, but again, I just go back to the, like, I get why the Biden administration doesn't want to face this problem. No one else has wanted to, right? Who wants to be on what perceived to be the other side of caring for disadvantaged communities? Like, I don't want to be there. Um, and if we just tell ourselves a story that we can do both things at once and there's no trade-off, we are just going to muddle till 2087. Hi, uh, my name is Leah Stokes. I'm a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute. Um, I really agree with what you were saying about wind energy development. I just published a paper about that, which largely agrees with what you're saying. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about your organization is you don't just represent, uh, you know, clean energy companies, you also represent utilities. And one of the disturbing things that I've seen since the IRA passed is that a number of uh, utilities, including your members, have actually proposed even more gas plants than before the IRA was passed. Um, there's 15 gigawatts more being proposed right now. And so I guess I'm wondering, how do you square that additional new gas plant proposals with all the incentives that we're seeing for offshore wind, onshore wind, solar? Um, why, are, why are utilities doubling down on new gas plants? It's a great question. So first of all, you know, the superpower and original sin of my organization is bringing the clean energy developers and the utilities and some international oil companies into one organization. Most of you probably think that the battles over the last 20 years have been between fossil and clean energy. No, 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 no. The fights have been between utilities and clean energy developers, right? That's really where at the bottom line, the arguments have been. And so a few years ago, they decided they couldn't just keep kneecapping each other. They had they too codependent. Clean power is too much a part of the utilities future. So that's why my 20 years at the Bipartisan Policy Center has served me well as I've entered this new space. Um, I think you're seeing more gas for a couple of reasons. One is just much more demand than people had anticipated. The other is that while um, renewable power is very reliable, it is also very intermittent. And those are different things, right? We know that you're not gonna produce solar power at night. We know you're gonna produce it at the day. You can reliably produce it at the day and reliably not produce it at night. Um, Wind obviously has a little bit more of a at night, so you can sometimes balance this out. We're making progress super fast, but starting from a tiny little space on batteries. And right now batteries mostly can kind of store power for usually about four hours. And so the only way at this moment until battery technology or nuclear power comes forward in a significant um, meaningful way, we can have a renewables increases to have natural gas to back it up. And um, so there's always been kind of a frenemies relationship between um, gas and renewable power. And, you know, the uh, other issue with natural gas that's worth appreciating is that sometimes people think, well, you invest money and you just locked it in, right? So you just kind of thrown money into a hole and you're going to create more, you know, desire for incumbency and you're going to slow down and build political power for the past, not the future. And while there's you know, something to be concerned about there, people tend to underestimate the um, creative evolution of big industries. So if the government doesn't screw up the green hydrogen credits, you are gonna see commercial scale hydrogen, which can displace natural gas in combustion, right? You're not gonna see natural, and you can be building a natural gas turbine and not assuming that you're stuck with natural gas for 30 years. Um, there's also natural gas infrastructure that um, if we're smart, we're going to stop using gas in you know, 15, 20 years and be exporting it to other countries for another 15 or 20 years. And this goes back a little bit to the kind of reality that the developed world is going to be probably a phase behind in decarbonization. But if we could displace coal in India and China with U.S. fracked gas moved to the coasts, 
huge climate benefits. And so I think that there's gonna, you know, it is true. And it is also a reflection of the challenges we're having moving forward on clean energy. Hi, thanks for this. Um, on transmission and the goal to send power to a region that might need it, um, considering high rates of private ownership in energy infrastructure, what does that look like for governance, compliance, interoperability? Yeah. What are the hurdles there? So the underlying theme of your question, I'll just state, which is there are a lot of people who think like this is critical infrastructure. This is like the highway system. You know, the only way we're going to really get it built when we really believe that we're in a crisis is the government's just going to have to take out the laser pointer and say, these are where the lines are going and they're going to be, you know, initially paid for out of public funding. They're just a, a very different kind of centralized. And there are many, 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 many awful things about the governance process in China. Boy, are they good at building infrastructure, right? So I think that you might have to see some different kind of imagination if the nation ever really gets into a, a crisis mode. Absent that, you just describe the reasons that it's not working well, right? I mean, everything you mentioned is a hurdle that right now is full of a lot of friction and slowing things down. So one last question before we wrap up. Uh, 20 years ago, someone in your job in what would have been a much smaller technology-focused trade association would have been thinking, how do we extend the PTC for another year or two? And maybe how do we work with a couple of state capitals on a renewable portfolio standard? And that might've been the scope of the policy landscape on which they engaged. Mm -hmm. You have a much broader landscape. You know, one thing that comes to mind is right now the US and the EU are trying to negotiate on steel and aluminum. Steel is a pretty important input to a lot of your member companies' business. So how do you go about managing your time and how do you go about managing your staff to engage on what is a much more complicated and you know, perhaps exciting and rich, but perhaps this is why there's freaking crisis every day. It's a much different policy landscape than in the past. How, how do you go about tackling that job uh, day to day? That is a cruel question. Um, <laughs> so just at the outset, just to emphasize something like, the fact that we're facing these problems is because we're finally big time, right? Like, you know, 15 years ago, we didn't have to worry that much about trade. We didn't have to worry that much about trans. Like, you know, renewables were a nice little niche thing that made people feel good. Um, so good problems, right? Dog has caught car, future of the world at stake, good. That's part of the answer to your question. You know, this is a mission-driven industry that wants to make money. But there truly is a sense of like deep commitment among every one of my members, staff, like people are motivated by more than just, you know, what's the economics of copper. Um, and so that helps, that sustains people working um, for long hours with inadequate pay. Um, there is also um, an effort underway, and this is real time, is just figuring out how you build an organization that's very different than what it used to look like. So to Joe's point, you know, the job used to be prying tax credits out of the federal government, which was important work, but pretty focused. Now that it is actually trying to implement, um, you know, we are just, we have like 200 committees. I'm never supposed to admit that, but um, there is a proliferation of conversation that um, we are working to bring together. And part of the reason is like every technology kind of had its own game and now we're trying to kind of coalesce everybody into one multi-tech platform. Um, but look, I, you know, I'm whining, it's super fun. I mean, it, you know, when do you get a chance to work on big hard problems with people you like um, where there are real consequences to success and failure? I think that tends to motivate at least for the time being um, the American Clean Power Association. Great. Before we wrap up, uh, let me remind you, we'll meet again at noon Monday next week. Elliot Derringer, who is the Senior Policy Advisor to the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, will join us with his reflections on international climate policy. And finally, please join me in thanking Jason Grumet for his insights today. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you.